Good morning, everybody. Wisconsin State Senator Romaine Quinn is back for our monthly chat today, Thursday, October 26th, 2023. For DrydenWire.com, I'm Ben Dryden, and you're watching Dryden Wire Live, presented by Americans for Prosperity Wisconsin. Uh, AFP Wisconsin works to reignite the American dream and break down government barriers that hold us back from our full potential. Learn more at americansforprosperity.org and join AFP to fight for more freedom for all Wisconsinites. As a reminder, Senator Quinn joins us live on the last Thursday of every month right here on Dryden Wire Live. If you've missed any of our previous shows, you can find a recording of those on our website at drydenwire.com, right here on Facebook under our videos tab, or maybe easier, we store all of our recorded or all of our uh, live shows on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash drydenwire. Uh, because we do these shows live, it also gives our viewers the chance to ask Senator Quinn questions. So please feel free to put in your question during today's show. Romaine, good morning. Welcome back. Morning. Only easy questions. Right? Well, I wanted to put intelligent <laughs> questions, but that's subjective. <laughs> true, true. What, what is an intelligent question? I, I'm not really sure. Yeah. So how's it going? Before uh, We always want to kind of go through what I love about these shows. I have nothing written down to make sure we talk about. It's just what are the bills being worked on, what's happening down in Madison or in the 25th Senate District. But first, you know, it's been a month. How have you been? Good. Things are good. It's been a busy fall slash summer, and I don't know how November is already here. But time flies when you're having fun, right? <laughs> how can people say that, but I always feel like it's sarcastic. Yeah, yes. I, yeah. <laughs> so you have been, I've noticed, a lot of things going on down in Madison. So I might as well get right to it. Uh, there was a Brewers thing I saw recently. There was a, some healthcare stuff I've seen. But I never know which part of this, you know, it's like a, GOP legislators are introducing. And it's, well, I don't know if you're a part of any of these things. So why don't we just start with, is there something that you have been working on that has gotten done? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been on the floor at least two times since the last time we had this show passed a number of bills uh, this last floor date. A number of my bills personally passed the floor. Hold on. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just turning the heat down. I can okay. still hear you. <laughs> Perfect. So for your listeners, uh, we did a package of bills uh, called Embrace Them Both. And that's something that we've been working on for probably over six months, not long after I got into the legislature, just because the nature of the abortion debate that's been taking place across Wisconsin. Um, so we tried to find a package of bills that aren't necessarily pro-choice or pro-life. I think they're, well, they are pro-life, uh, but there's something that the general public, I think, should support regardless of where you're at on the issue of abortion. So we introduced uh, four different bills. The first one is a redefining what abortion actually is. And so we want to make it crystal clear that the definition of abortion is the intentional ending of that human life. So if you need care that results in the unintentional ending of that baby's life, that is not considered an abortion. So uh, women that have to remove an eptopic pregnancy, uh, the removal of a miscarriage, uh, a molar pregnancy, different complications like oh, that. Oh, sorry, one. what's that last, uh, what pregnancy? Molar? Uh, molar pregnancy. Yeah, and it's, it's technically by some definitions, not necessarily even a pregnancy, but we made, to, made sure to include it because we wanted to define in-state statute all these situations that women could face that we wanna make sure they're not actually considered an abortion and you can get the care that you need. And so it has never been the pro-life position to allow women to die due to their pregnancy. That's just not the case. And I think there's been a lot of rhetoric on both sides naturally during the campaign cycle. So. We wanted to just take those issues off the table, make it crystal clear for doctors and physicians, crystal clear for families and mothers um, who may need some form of care due to an unfortunate circumstance. So that was probably um, the most important one out of the gate. And then we wanted to follow up with more resources for families. I think a lot of times the pro-life community gets knocked for saying you're pro-birth, but you're not pro-family because once the child's born, um, you don't care about them anymore. We hear that all the time um, in Madison, which simply is not true. Uh, but we wanted to pass a number of other bills along with that. So another one that passed was providing more resources to pregnancy resource centers. So if you find yourself um, during your pregnancy or post-pregnancy facing an unexpected pregnancy that you choose to bring to term, those centers can provide resources for you and your new family 
um, as you're learning to become a parent, which maybe you weren't expecting. So we've got a great uh, PRC in Rice Lake. They do a phenomenal job. They actually um, run a house of hope where a mother can actually live for free um, with her child for up to three years to develop that relationship, figure out how to become a parent um, and just give them a great start. So uh, these resource centers do do a lot of great work and we think the state should support them in that work. So on, when those bills happen, because sometimes I, th- I don't understand how everything works. I know a lot of times things have to go through the assembly first and then it has to go to the Senate and then, but I think there are some things the Senate does then maybe not the assembly. I don't know. Is this something that the assembly had to do first? No, we acted first this time. So we passed the bills and then we messaged them to the assembly. And so now they're in the other house. Um, We have to find out for sure. I think they've had their hearings. Um, And then, yeah, they can either be exec or pulled to the floor directly since they've already been passed in the Senate. Okay, so it's gotten passed in both, but right now the Assembly and the uh, Senate are quote-unquote controlled by Republicans, yep. have the majority. Uh, is, the, is the governor, I'm sure he's aware of this bill, do you have any hopes that these things are going to ultimately get passed, or is this going to be a hard no, or you know what, we don't really know what he's going to do? Well, the third one we passed was also to support adoptions, and so... Again, we did three things. Defined what actually abortion is, provide more resources for pregnancy resource centers to help families, and then provide more resources for those who want to adopt children. So Wisconsin under our bill would provide a $10,000 grant to offset the costs of adopting a Wisconsin child. Because we know adoption um, is extremely expensive and it's prohibitive for many families who would make a great home for a kiddo that needs a home. And so our it was a little disappointing on the floor. The adoption bill was bipartisan. Had a few uh, of my Democratic colleagues uh, come to our side and vote for it. Uh, unfortunately, the other ones were along party lines, um, which is kind of unfortunate. So I don't know if that's a signal to the governor to veto them. But uh, like I said on the floor, too, just encouraging people to step back. This isn't about whether you think life begins at conception or six weeks or 10 weeks or, a, you know, being allowed to have an abortion up until the moment of birth. None of that applies here. All we're doing is taking ambiguity out of the law so women know that they can get health care they need. And believe it or not, not every family is going to abort their children. And so for those that choose to have their kids, uh, we want to provide them with more resources. And so I would hope that's something that the general public can support because that's what we were aiming for with this package of bills. Is this where the politics part comes in? Is there a, a, a chance, and of course I'm speaking hypothetically here, and no politician ever likes a hypothetical question or these types, but as hosts, we love asking these kinds of questions, um, where it's if the governor did sign this uh, or these specific things, it would almost look like a win for Republicans, and we can't have that, especially as regarding this topic when it's, listen, I'm not going to sign anything unless this is uh, 100% women's choice, et cetera. All this stuff is just, nope, not doing any of it. Are you concerned at all about that? Yeah, and I I mean, I'm not going to hold my breath um, for him to sign it. We'll see what happens. But that's the thing. I, I think if you were to sit the governor down and have coffee with him and ask him what he thought about these bills outside of the building, he'd be like, oh. Okay. Right, because it sounds like these are all, right. it sounds like how you presented it. This is This is good stuff. Right. We, we should totally do this. But that's where the politics may play a role. Yeah. And um, right or wrong, it's just it's the world we're in. Right. Um, there's also a fourth bill. We didn't pass it yet. It's got to be dipped in another finance committee. But it would take our current child deduction that you can you file when you have a dependent. And we want to allow people, uh, families who are expecting a child, children still in the womb, to count for that deduction. And so if you're pregnant in one right. tax year, have the kid the following year, you can get that deduction the year you were pregnant and expecting that child. Because we know expenses don't start only after the child's born. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they start while you're expecting. And yeah. so if those are children in the womb, um, for our tax purposes, we should apply the same deductions to them too. And so we want to do that as well. We just haven't gotten that one to the floor quite yet. Where did, Last time you were on, last month, because you're on the last Thursday of every month, we talked yep. about the Brewers Stadium bill. I don't think we got really into a lot of the detail, but we kind of touched on that. Where are we with this? The, 
for people who don't know, give a quick bullet point of what this thing was about and where are we now? Yeah, so the Brewers um, lease will expire. Um, so for people that don't know, we are the largest owner of AmFam Field, former Milwaukee um, Miller Park. We as so in? We as in the state of Wisconsin. Um, the state of Wisconsin, through the park board, owns uh, about 67% of the stadium, and the other percentage is owned by the Brewers. And so um, every so often, you know, the stadium has to be kept. I think the rule is you have to be kept, your stadium has to be to a standard of 75% of the other stadiums in the MLB league. And so you have to constantly main, make sure you're maintaining, upgrading, and keeping up the stuff, snuff. Now, right or wrong, that's just MLB requirements. So we know there is going to be a number of maintenance needs, upgrade needs over the course of the coming decades that right now we really don't have a way to pay for it. And so the legislature has been trying to find a way to extend the brewer's lease, lock them in, keep them here in Wisconsin longer, and find a way to share in those costs to make sure the stadium is maintained to MLB standards through the foreseeable future. And so, so far, uh, the deal would lock the brewers here through 2050. Um, it, they would pay a, an additional $100 million over the course of that lease in rent payments as tenants of the building. Uh, the city of Milwaukee, I believe in the county of Milwaukee, would kick in $67 million um, over the course of that period. And the state of Wisconsin would kick in $400 million Wait. roughly over the course of that period, which um, I, we saw the tables yesterday. It breaks out to like $12 million a year, some years $15 million a year, $20 million yeah. in the last okay. five years is, is nothing. So we've obviously had conversations of I have just – ideological problems with taxpayers building sports stadiums for billionaire owners. Um, yeah. It just, it, it kind of frustrates me. I think um, the owner of the Brewers bought them for 235 million. They're now worth 1.6 billion um, as a team, if you were to sell them. And so obviously he is uh, very much grown in wealth. And I would say maybe they need to kick in a little more <laughs> of that value um, for the wealth that he's been able to create while playing in our stadium. So I, there's no doubt the Brewers are a Wisconsin icon. Um, they're an economic engine for the state um, through the sales tax, through ticket sales, through the people they bring into downtown Milwaukee. Um, but we need to make sure that at a minimum, the Brewers are paying for the upkeep, their percentage of ownership, not 21%. You know, it comes out to be like 33, 34%. They should be paying that portion at a minimum. Um, and the locals definitely need to kick in some of that money too because they're the direct beneficiaries right. of having Miller Park uh, right in their community. So yeah. I don't know where it's going to go at this point. There's still negotiations of the brewers don't want a ticket tax. They don't want to tax um, upper on ticket sales. Some of us do want it. Use that ticket sales tax to offset the state contribution you know, there is the argument that the brewers go away. We don't collect their income sale, their income tax, which is about $12 million a year. So they're trying to play it off as a wash. If they're not here, sure. we don't collect $12 million a year. If we spend $12, 12 million a year, they stay. So it's a net wash, but there's also obviously other benefits to having the brewers here besides just income tax collection. So hmm. it's, a, it's a complicated deal. The, uh, the, it's always changing to try to garner more votes to get people comfortable. I've been pretty clear from the beginning. I'm not comfortable. Uh, I was also a no on the Buck Stadium as well. Um, I just don't like being held hostage. Like if you don't do this, we will leave. You know those kinds of conversations. Yeah, and honestly, and I don't know if they've ever used those words. And I know that you you're not saying that that's what specifically they said. If you don't, then we're out of here. But that's certainly implied. And I don't yep. know much about your world, but I know a decent amount about sports, dude. They're not going anywhere. One, where are you going to go? There's literally. What in the world just happened? Yeah, I saw this big th oh. <laughs> I have no idea what that was or how you, it happened or any reactions on your page now. I, I have <laughs> no clue what that was. That's crazy. Um, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, but yeah, so there's no, but there's, <laughs> first of all, where are you going to go? Like Nashville has been saying that they wanted one, but I'm just saying there's not a lot of markets right now that would be, that, that are really available at this point. Um, and they're doing just fine. That, as you just referenced, what the, the value of that stadium is. But if you just, and anybody can do this, just Google it. 
but look at their their attendance, look at how much money they've made and their revenue over a year. This is considered a quote-unquote small market team, but don't kid yourself, they do very well for their size. And there isn't a bigger market, really, for them to go anyway, so I'd be shocked if they actually left. But I'm sure, like most things, there's going to be a happy medium here. So to kind of put a bow on this one, what would you need to see from them in order for you to, to start moving the needle for you to say, okay, I can get behind this? Is it what you just said? You have to start, whether it's ticket sales, you guys come up with a plan. But ultimately, it's you guys got to chip in a lot more. Is that ultimately what you're waiting for or looking for? Well, I, I've already told my leadership team that I was a no. So I don't think they're negotiating to get my vote. Got it. <laughs> at this point. Um but no, I think the longer this drags out, the better the deal is going to get for taxpayers. So I don't think we need to be in any rush to sign an agreement. Um, the more it comes down to the wire, the more people sweat, the more they offer to get something on the table. You know, I think the state did offer them initially to sell them the stadium for a buck. You want to stay, you can own it, you can have it, and uh, you maintain it. Uh, they did not want that. <laughs> and I thought, well, cripes, if we're going to spend $400 million over 2050, why not pay him $100 million to take the stadium and wipe our hands clean? Um, not a so bad idea. I, I, don't think those, I don't think those conversations are happening, but oh. um, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see. I mean, if the deal gets exponentially better and it makes total sense and it doesn't cost state taxpayer dollars, then yeah, I could probably get there. But uh, yeah. I don't think it's in the cards right now. Uh, what else is uh, what other bills are you either working on or that are kind of a hot topic thing right now down in Madison or maybe even in uh, the 25th Senate district? Yeah, so we try not to do bills that are hot topics, right? I guess our pro life bills kind of tended to be, but Chance and I just got a bill passed. Um, we'll see when the governor signs it for very simple, but again, we're always just trying to solve problems that pop up. Uh, so during that last storm, we had when we got pummeled with all that ice we were without power for a week i think you got hit up in spooner pretty bad too mm -hmm. um what we found is co-ops are not allowed to drive their utv vehicles when repairing uh storm damage on highways it's against the law because they're not considered a utility company so utility companies are allowed to so if you're xl you can drive these things anywhere to get your towers back up and live but if you're a co-op baron electric jump sure. electric race electric bayfield electric you can't do that. So oh. uh, we just changed the law and that bill was passed this last month too, nice. allowing those crews flexibility to get where they need to go. Um, and then we also, Chance and I got to do a tour of some sites in Ashland that are facing um, flooding issues. And so we know with the storm events we've been having and the topography that we have in Northern Wisconsin, we, have, we are susceptible to some bad flooding. So if you remember, I think it was like four years ago or five years ago, we had like a hundred or a thousand year flood, blew out bridges, blew out culvers, uh, culverts, blew out roads um, up in Ashland County. Mm -hmm. And so due to the soil nature, the topography, Ashland County is just prone to it. So we said, instead of just fixing and putting in the same size culvert every time um, or a bigger culvert just to allow more water, why aren't we stopping water Where upstream? I, rem I think we've talked about this in the past. Yep. Because it and rings so, a bell, yeah. Yep, we set aside two million bucks in the budget. And then I actually got to go and tour some sites where they're actually doing the work. So that was pretty cool. So Chance and I went to four different sites in Ashland County where they're finding unique ways to slow water, catch water, keep it on the landscape, um, where it will, it's pos positive for taxpayers and it's positive for the environment. We found some other issues that we need to address, I think, um, with federal law, but we'll have to talk to Congressman Tiffany about that. Uh, due to floodplain issues and getting the Army Corps of Engineers to use some common sense. Um, but yeah, we're always, we're always plugging away. So that was cool to be able to see on the ground. Here's what I did in the assembly. We had a pilot project. Now we can do many more of these projects to help farmers, help townships, taxpayers on the ground to mitigate some of these problems that they have. We have a, a, a large surplus right now, right? We do. And, and I thought... And it was, what's that? Significant. Yeah. How much is it right now? It's about, about $7 billion. Jeepers. Look where we, look how far, we, holy cow. How far we come in 12 years-ish. Yep. Where are yeah. we at like a $3 billion deficit about that back in, I don't know, 2010-ish? 3.6. Yeah. Um, 
So that's quite a turnaround. But you know, you guys need to go to <clears throat> all, all just start taking over our federal budget. <laughs> that's yeah, no that's kidding. that's ridiculous. I uh, would put our joint finance team up against any of those congressional plans all day long. That's awesome. <laughs> all uh, day long. But I've seen there's a child care thing. Governor Evers, I think we may have even posted one of his press releases, but it's oh, though you know those Republicans won't give me however much it is. I can't remember. It was hundreds of millions of dollars to do something. Um, so what are we doing with that now? What is kind of the plan? Because we do have a surplus, and hey, that's great. Yep. But, I mean, it's nice to keep saving and saving, but at some point, let's spend some of it or send some back, which honestly, I know, I'm weird this way. I, I don't, we don't need the money back. We've already paid for it. Just put it to some good use, something that is sustainable. So what's the plan? We got seven, $7 billion surplus. Yep. What are we doing with it? Well, we did pass a workforce package um, last time on the floor that did include an income tax reduction um, as well. So that would have ate up about two, um, two and a half billion ongoing. So there's a difference between the money sitting in the pot right now that's continuing to be there, or was it a one-time over taxation? And so, yes, there's seven billion. It doesn't mean we can spend seven billion on oh. payroll tomorrow because we don't have seven billion going forward. It was right. over collected one year. So I think over half of that is one time money. The other half is ongoing. We're just naturally collecting more than we're spending. And so, which means we didn't do a good job, right? Our projections were way off. We took way more from you over the course of this year than we needed per the budget that we set. Um, so it's it's not a bad thing. We just, we didn't do a good job. I shouldn't say we, I wasn't in, but uh, mm -hmm. they over, uh, they underspent or overtaxed. And so it should be a combination. I think we should reduce rates. We're, we're the economy is growing. We're collecting more than we've ever collected. We can actually reduce the amount you pay in, and we're still going to collect more than we've ever collected before. Because when you allow people to keep more money in their own pocket, they invest it, they spend it, um, they do things for their family, and eventually it results in more tax collections. And so it's funny. Every time Republicans cut taxes, the other side freaks out. But then the next budget, we have more revenue than ever before. It's It grows every time we cut taxes. It doesn't make sense mm -mm. on its front value, but the economics of by putting more money in your pocket, you spend it, <clears throat> it works through your economy seven times over, and the state's going to collect more over time on I that. See. So, um, but you're right. There's, there's more things we can do. I think the governor was, the frustrating part, we talked about child care accounts. Yep. It was a federal program direct subsidies to child care centers to keep them open, deal with the pandemic, raise wages for staff, pay bonuses for hazard pay. Um, but the problem is that industry has been underfunded and underpaying for years. And so now the industry is saying, although it was a pandemic program, we need this forever to keep our doors open and to maintain um, the services we have. So there's some in the legislature that don't like the program. They'd rather find ways to put money in a parent's pocket where you can pay a higher rate that you need for your center to be open versus just cutting a check to the center. So that that's where the give and take is. But the governor, which most people don't talk about, has about a billion dollars left in ARPA funding that he can use at his discretion. It's not up to the legislature. Doesn't have to tell us how much he has left or how he uses it. Um, he can use that. So he's been running around the state saying, all these centers are gonna close if you don't give them 340 million, while well, at the same time, he's sitting on a billion that he could use tomorrow um, for the same program. So last week he said, all right, I'm going to give 170 million to that program. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fund it halfway, keep it going through 2025 to help these centers. Well, great. Why didn't you tell them that six months ago? <laughs> I mean, why, why don't you fund it at 340 million? You've got a billion dollars um, at your discretion that you could fund it. So. Again, it's just a, a debate on on how we view child care, how we want to fund it, support it uh, going forward at this point. Yeah. So with having a budget surplus, does that change things for you? I mean, you've been in the Assembly in the past and now you're in the Senate. Is this a, ooh, we got a little extra more? Or really, no, right now we're focusing on just uh, the little things because – as Fitzy and I know in our show, it's our mantra on our show, little things make a big difference. Uh, what you were just talking, the earlier things you are talking about up in uh, Ashland and the culvert stuff, little stuff. Uh, the, the thing with the XL or, or uh, utility companies versus the, the, the 
uh, what was it that can use these Co-op. things? Yep. Who, Co-ops. Who, yeah. Electric yeah. Co-ops. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that stuff makes a difference. So we'll keep focusing on that stuff. But is there any talks of some big ticket items or it's just a whole bunch of smaller ones? Well, having a surplus enables us to even do the smaller ones because if the budget was tight and it was done, we never would have got $2 million to do these projects up in Ashland County. So they do enable us to do things that we couldn't do before. But I would say there's there's always big ticket conversations. I mean, I would say getting Wisconsin to a flat income tax uh, is a big ticket item and it's going to take billions of dollars to do and we're in a position to potentially do it. So right now we have the second highest income tax bracket in the Midwest behind Illinois. No, behind Minnesota. Illinois is cheaper than us. It is cheaper income taxes in Illinois than it is in the state of Wisconsin. Um, Iowa's going to a flat tax. Michigan's rates are flatter than ours. Okay, so for other people, we may not know what that means. Yep. What is a flat tax? I mean, it sounds so, like a tax that's flat, but I don't know what that means. I've heard this before, but I don't, I'm don't. i not going to pretend like I've understood it. Right. So the you pay both federal and state income taxes out of your paycheck. Um, and so right now, Wisconsin has tiered brackets, depending on your income level. Mm-hmm. And our highest bracket right now for our highest earners, which you might not care about because they're our highest earners, but those types of people, they don't have to live in Wisconsin. And most of them in Wisconsin, people don't realize is they're, that's, they're filing as their business. So there are small businesses. So our small businesses in our state, a vast majority of them, are paying higher income taxes than they would in Illinois, in Michigan, Iowa, Indiana. So when you're talking about where should we do business, why would they pick Wisconsin or why would they stay in Wisconsin? Our electric rates are some of the highest in the country. So the cost of doing business here is not cheap. And so if I have assets, I have means, and I have a business that I could operate elsewhere, why wouldn't I? And so that's where I think we always need to be conscientious when we're saying we have billions of dollars extra. Why are we collecting more from people than we need at a time where they could go somewhere else and not pay that at all when they're making a business decision? So it doesn't have to be a race to the bottom, but we have to be competitive. So, so I think this is almost like a more of a, a foundational change, a fundamental change yeah. in. So what would a flat tax, if you can like dumb it down for me, bullet point version Yep. Flat tax for, uh, uh, is it for family or individuals? Actually, it doesn't matter. Everybody. Okay, so is this, what does that look like? What what does that mean, a flat tax? Like everybody doesn't matter how much you make or if it's for business or personal, everyone pays the same amount? What what does that mean? Yeah, so it would be, so our corporate tax is separate. Um, But yes, it would be a flat income tax. So for instance, I think I was going to 4%. So that's for everybody. It doesn't matter how much you make. Yep. So if you're a family that makes 50 grand a year, you're an individual that makes 80 grand a year, you're going to pay 4% on your income to the state of Iowa, living in Iowa. Okay. And don't and forget, there's a lot of states that don't pay any income tax. So I didn't know that. Yeah, right. So as a retiree, I'm retiring. I worked for Washburn County PD. Um, I'm going to pay income tax on my pension. But I also have maybe a small residence in Florida because I like to go there three months out of the year. So Florida doesn't have an income tax. So as a resident of Washburn County, I'm going to become a Florida citizen and I'm gonna give up my Wisconsin citizenship because Florida is not gonna tax my pension because they have 0% income tax. And so now we will lose, instead of, (laughs) now we get nothing on that person's pension that retired that worked for Washburn County Sheriff's Department, right? And so that's, a, that's again, an economic and a political decision we have to make saying, is it worth re- reducing that rate and keeping retirees here in Wisconsin potentially longer um, and keeping their monies here, right? Because once they go to Florida, you're probably not getting them back. Um, yeah, I always thought it was just the weather why, you know, a lot of older people move to Florida. It was just the weather. They're old, like, you know what, I'm tired of the cold. Uh, I'm going right. to my last 20 years in warm. I thought that's what it was. But I wonder if this is a playing a part of that role, too. Well, that's part of it, too. Yep. Yeah. I don't believe Texas has an income tax. Now, granted, they have other things like higher sales tax. They have oil well, money. Well, it's got to come from somewhere. It's just about re- the reallocation of it. Um, what's the pushback on this stuff? Why? Uh, I'm assuming, like everything, it has to be a partisan thing. Yep. So is this a Republicans where, yay, this is a good idea? 
which means, and maybe not every Republican and maybe not every Democrat is new, but of the, the people that are advocates for it, this is why it's good. And you've kind of just touched on some of those, but what are, about those that are like, no, this is horrible. This is a bad idea. What are the reasons for that that you've heard? So they still think that people that earn more should pay more. I get that. Um, so that's why, you know, yeah. the governor vetoed the tax cut originally out of the budget. So the last bill we passed, we came back and said, fine, we're going to not touch the top bracket, even though it's the second highest in the Midwest. I think we have to acknowledge that at some point, but let's not touch it. So we only lowered the two middle brackets, the middle class brackets. Okay. And so that's going to get to his desk and we'll see what happens. Trying to find a compromise um, again to put more money back in your pocket. So anyone's making more than $13 and 30 cents an hour would see an income tax reduction from the state of Wisconsin. Now, obviously, the the more you make, the more you're going to see in a tax cut because that's just how it works. Right. If you're paying more in, you're going to see more of a reduction because you're paying more already. Um, so that's where we're at. But yeah, there's just there's philosophical differences behind it. There are some people in Madison that want that have found a way to spend all seven billion of that and then some. Like it's never enough. <laughs> just, <laughs> nice. There there are people out there like that. So they hate every tax cut. That's money they can't spend. How they see fit on a program yeah. so not saying those programs aren't important but you have to find a balance yeah is that it going to be coming up so so the one you just said that is now on evers's desk or soon to be i can't remember what you just said it was it is now or it's going to be but the tax cut for the four or six percent or the the, the bottom two uh, yep. is, is that already done and over with or we're waiting for that and you, you know, have a while ago and i i don't i'd have to look again i I'm assuming he was threatening it with a veto originally. Um, okay. Cause it, and again, it was part of a greater package, yeah. reduce taxes on families, um, invest more in our workforce. We passed a number of bills to create uh, interstate compacts for licensing. So if you're a social worker, a physician assistant, a counselor, um, we want Wisconsin to be in a compact in the Midwest so you can move here tomorrow and start practicing. We don't want you to have to start going through all your relicensing right all your re-education. We need your workers now. So if you want to come to Wisconsin, you're a licensed professional in Indiana, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, come up here and you can start practicing tomorrow. So again, trying to get people back to work, invest in our workforce, um, entice practitioners to come here. But again, if I'm a, if I'm a psychiatrist in Iowa and I make really good money because, and we need them, why would I move to Wisconsin? Instead of paying 4%, I'm paying 7.65% of my income to state tax. Why would I move to Wisconsin? I wouldn't. Well, if we look at it strictly from a financial standpoint, it wouldn't make any sense. Right, right. And what else do we have to offer? I mean, Wisconsin has a lot to offer, right? But the brewers, I guess. Iowa's got big bucks. They've got, they've got snow, fall. Uh, We both grow a lot of corn. (laughs) So, I mean, they're good people too. So what, I mean, what's going to bring them here if it costs them more to live here? So I think those are the kinds of things we just have to keep, uh, in the back of our mind as we're making policy decisions. Yeah, I get it. How is overall, now you've been in the Senate for how long now? Uh, oh, ten, way too ten, long. Ten Nine months. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're back in the Senate. You were in the Assembly. And when you're in the Assembly, you were in the Assembly when Scott Walker was governor, right? Yep. And then you were, of course, for a while there when Evers was governor. I can't remember for how long, though. Yes. Um, so, so you've had two different governors. Now you're in the Senate. You've been in there for uh, nine, 10 months. I was sworn in back in January. Overall, how's it going? Uh, Republicans control the, the, the assembly and the Senate. However, a number of things get vetoed. And as you and I know, and most people know that the governor has, what do people say? The most powerful veto pen in America as a governor can single yep. line item veto stuff. Overall, though, a lot of the things that people talk about are those hot topic uh, uh, social issues or policy issues. But there's a lot of other things that get done behind the scenes that are no, it doesn't make the news like a few things that you just kind of referenced. But those are important. And the governor signs them because duh, this, these are easy ones. We should all get yep. behind. But overall, is it going well? I mean, I think I think the state is in a good position right now. I think we're financially on solid footing. I would argue because the legislature does say no occasionally. Um, I, you know, I think 
you know, we just invested a lot of money into a lot of different programs, into our schools, nursing homes, hospitals. Um, being more of a full-time legislature, I think we have the capability of really crafting good policy that sometimes other states don't have. We've got great, great attorneys, great bill drafters, great resources that help us do a good job. Um, so yeah, I think, I think Wisconsin isn't a good place, but we can always do better and we have to continue to do better or we'll fall behind. Um, but there are still real challenges going forward. I mean, childcare is an issue. Workforce is an issue. Um, our businesses need workers. Our labor force particip participation rate is down. Um, energy rates are still high in this state. If you're, if you're doing business, the cost of doing business, I think our reading and math levels for our K through 12 kids are at a fourth grade level are still dismal 40%. Now, historically it's always been low, but I, I, it sometimes it takes me back. Think about that for a second. It, no, when I, I was am. in school, That's crazy. when I was in school, there's no way that I would have thought 60% of my classmates couldn't read at grade level. Like there's no way. Like, but the parents would have burnt down the Rice Lake School District. <laughs> yes. If 60% yeah. of my classmates yeah. couldn't read at grade level. It would be unacceptable. Yeah. But there are other places in the state where, for whatever reason, it's being accepted. And in my mind, it's unacceptable. So we have real challenges. Um, I think long-term, educated workforce, quality workforce, quality of uh, the jobs and careers that we can offer here in Wisconsin. Um, so those are all things we have to always continue to improve on to make sure that the next generation has the same opportunity that we've enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, uh, so obviously you come on the last the third of every month. So, ne Oh shoot. November. That's going to be around Thanksgiving. Well, we, we may have a different date that it should work. When does hunting start and you hunt, don't you? Yep. It's the middle of November. So it is, it's the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, that's a weird time to put it. Yep, it always falls that way. So you have yeah, to come don't out. Don't spend the woods, time with family. Go out in the go out in the woods. Whatever. Leave the woods. Go pretend you like your family for a day, and then go back <laughs> out in the woods. So. Got it. <laughs> uh, all right. So, what do you think we're going to be talking about next, uh, in terms of uh, policies and legislative ongoings? What do you think we're going to be talking about uh, next month? Well, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion again around the UW system. Um, if you recall, right now the the speaker is still very set on withholding any pay raises from the entire institution until they cut their diversity, equity, and inclusion positions. Um, so there's a big fight between the UW and the legislature right now. I think the Brewers deal will probably be done by next month, whatever that looks like. Um, so that I think there will be a vote on that. Uh, yes, and there's obviously there's the, the right of first refusal bill. We talked about that. I think yeah, Megan I, was, I was literally just thinking about that one too. I was going to ask, because I think it was uh, Julian Bradley. We had posted a press release from him on uh, yep. this. And I made a few calls and some people I know down in Madison or, you know, around the Capitol there. And I said, where is kind of everybody? And they said, you know, interestingly enough, most people are, not most, they were a little surprised that Julian Bradley had uh, was on this side I, I don't know why they were surprised. I didn't ask them why they were, were surprised, but a lot of Republicans really aren't behind this. And it's just kind of weird. It's like his, you know, it's just a hill you want to die on kind of a thing. Uh, so for people who don't know, give the quick recap of what this right of first refusal is. And then where are you on this? Yeah. So I know we're, we're probably butting up to our time, but we'll keep it, try to keep it simple. So yeah. what the bill would do is say, for interstate transmission lines and a bigger conversation we need to have right now is that over the next decade we're going to be spending tens of billions of dollars updating and upgrading and creating new transmission lines for the renewable transition that we see taking place so it's great that you can build a thousand megawatt wind farm in iowa but you have to get the power to the grid and so we are going to be spending which I don't think we take into account when we talk about the fossil fuel cost of renewables, you know, spending billions of dollars of fossil fuel created transmission lines to electrify ourselves even further mm. um, because it has to travel somewhere. So regardless of that, it's coming. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is who should be allowed to own and operate these transmission lines? And so right now, if we pass the bill, it's called right of first refusal. The incumbent provider would have the right and the only person to be able to build that transmission line. 
So in our state, we have three incumbent providers. It's Excel, ATC, and Dairyland Power. And so Dairyland Power um, is our co-op owned provider that serves us here in Western Wisconsin. So from Bayfield Electric, all the way down to South of La Crosse, all of our electric rural co-ops are our member owners of Dairyland Power. And so the problem is not, not I don't know how deep we wanna get into this, but so Dairyland Power right now does not build these size of transmission lines. So even though if we had a right of first refusal and the argument is the companies that are here know Wisconsin, we wanna keep the grid connected to only Wisconsin providers, um, they can do the job, et cetera. The problem is when we pass this bill, one of these providers, Dairyland, will also be shut out of all these projects because they don't build lines that big because they don't need them. They serve you and I in Northern Wisconsin that we don't need 345 KW massive transmission lines. So because of that, you and I as ratepayers pay into a greater system called MISO that funds these projects. But now Excel and ATC will be the only ones that get these projects under the Rofer bill. And so Dairyland Power would be shut out and so we would not have the ability as consumers to pass those costs on by owning a transmission line. So it's kind of confusing, but to dumb it all down is do we think only two companies in the state should have the right to all the projects that are coming to Wisconsin? Uh, I can new- answer that one. I don't care what the topic is. No. <laughs> I mean, it just, I don't care about any of that. I mean, in terms of what the issue is or what the topic is right now we're talking about electricity and power and grids i mean that's never really a good idea i mean the more people i would think also helps drive down costs as well doesn't it well i as a general rule um competitively bidding something out should result in a more affordable and better product right because because they have to compete now to the to the defense of the other side and i would say just to be very clear um Senator Bradley is a great guy. Yeah, I've heard that. He really has, he has done a great job managing yeah. this issue. He just simply agrees that incumbent utilities can build these better and maintain them long term better than someone from another state. And I think there's there's That's merit legit. to that discussion too. Sure. So it's just a matter of when it comes down to it, you know, do we want the government to mandate that who is going to get the bid no matter what, just based on the fact that you're already here? Yeah. And that is just something that it just doesn't sit well with who I am, right? There should be competition. There should be a marketplace for ideas and projects and, and um, the ability to bid those out and for competition to compete. Um, and how are we assured that as ratepayers we're getting the best bang for our buck um, when that's happening? So, um, again, there's, there's good people on both sides. Um, there's good lobbying groups on both sides. <laughs> Uh, I think there's merit to the arguments on both sides, um, but I know right now I'm I'm not comfortable with the bill. Sure, so. and I like these. Uh, I mean, first of all, we're supposed to have people, uh, whether it's Republican or Democrat or just people that are, have different philosophical views and yep. strong opinions on one side. That's how it's supposed to work. But I like these kinds of uh, topics because it isn't a social issue topic. It isn't a, mor- a moral issue topic. It's not one of those hot topic you know conversations. I mean, this is good. I, I, we want to see this. We want people to have to sit down and force to have these conversations to figure out what the plan is. But we're not talking about some of the things that, you know, get people really riled up, which that's totally legit that they do. Right. But I, I kind of like this. So where do you think this is uh, going to be addressed by our next show next month? Or this is going to be a longer process? I think it'll be longer. I don't think right now there are the votes to pass the bill. And with this issue with Dairyland Power kind of being not say it's necessarily locked out, but not being able to benefit from a row for bill, I think mm-hmm. puts a lot of us in rural Western Wisconsin, in even a harder position because at this point, if I voted yes on the row for bill, as it is today with no agreement for Dairyland power, I am guaranteeing that none of us ratepayers in Baird electric territory will see benefits of transmission line ownership period. Yep. We will Can't be paying, we will be paying, like everyone else, again, everyone else, multi-state area for these projects, but we will never have any ownership in it because our business model, we don't build them because we don't need them. Because if you go back to rural electrification, no one wanted us. No one wanted to bring us electricity. Right. So that's why co-ops were formed because we have customers, uh, miles per customer, not customers per mile, like other parts of the state. Right. So, yeah. 
So it's not, it's not cheap to bring me power down my dead end road. And I have three neighbors versus I could go down a city block in in Appleton and connect 50 people. Right. So just, uh, again, it's been interesting. I didn't, uh, I didn't ask for the uh, energy utilities committee, but I'm on it. So I get to participate. Oh, I didn't realize these. So, yeah. So, uh, I'm on the committee that got to hear the bill and ask questions. Right. And well, that's the first thing that we're going to bring up uh, next month's show is where are we on this? Cause I didn't realize that you were on that. Uh, so you could give us some, you know, insight on that. Very good. All right, cool. All right, we're uh, at 9.15, that's our time. I think uh, there was a question there. I'm sorry, Brian, we're not gonna, you know, ideally try to get those a little bit earlier. Um, what do you have coming up this week? Or what are we on Thursday, this weekend? Uh, what do you have coming up? Um, well, real quickly tonight there, uh, the assembly did a first responder of the year award. Sure, um, yeah. The Senate didn't, the assembly did. So all the assembly reps got to pick someone um, here in Barron County, Dave Armstrong. Uh, obviously we wanted to recognize our fallen officers. They truly are. We're our first responders of the year. Um, and then uh, Representative Sapic is honoring uh, Corey Barnett, the fire chief over there right. um, in Grantsburg. So that's tonight. So if you are in the Burnett County area, go on down to the Grantsburg yeah. Fire Hall, I believe. He's going to be getting that. Um, yeah, I think it's I at 530, I think. 530 tonight. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this weekend uh, on Friday, I'm heading up to Washburn. Representative Green and I both have a, we're doing a listening session in the city of Washburn up in Bayfield County. Um, so that'll be good. Um, but yeah, and then next week it's back to Madison and doing all the all the fun stuff again. So. Now, I know, you're, I know what the answer is that you're going to have to give, but do you enjoy the listening sessions? They're my favorite. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, they, no, they are. They're good. Um, actually I, I very much enjoyed the first one chance and I held in Bayfield. We went up to Bayfield, not Bayfield County, the city of Bayfield in the library and it was packed. And so listening sessions down here in Barron County, sometimes well attended, sometimes not just depends. Um, and I could just tell in that room that the knives were out, like they were ready, you know, how dare these two Republicans show up into Bayfield. And, uh, we actually had a great conversation. You know, there was a few one-offs that, you know, they were just angry. It was fine. Yeah. But there was a really good conversation. I think it was the first time Love many of them stuff. have met a Republican. <laughs> it's the first, <laughs> time, first time I've been in a room of people that I knew didn't like me before I walked in the door. But it, I mean, that's what we have to do, right? Let's yeah. talk about school funding. Let's talk about health care. Let's talk about infrastructure. We're not that far apart on some of this stuff. That's just it. We need to raise the public debate in this country. Uh, in a civil way. I remember going to a Sean Duffy when he was in the 7th Congressional District and he's doing a town hall here in Spooner. And I'd never been to any one of these before. This is when I first yep. started driving wire. This was a long time ago. I'm like, I'm just going to go and, you know, check it out. I brought my laptop, take some notes, but it wasn't for driving wire. I was going to do a story. And it was just brutal. I ended up doing a story on it just as a, here's my experience in my first one. He would go up and, you know, talk a little bit. And then everyone, no, lies. And they all brought signs and everything. They all had the same signs and lies and shame. And it's... Let the man freaking answer your question, right? So right. he asks a question, he starts talking, and everybody's going off. And I'm like, man, this is embarrassing. Like, I'm not right. saying I like the guy or I agreed with him, but if that's your only goal when you go to these, come on, right. be better. We're in Northwest Wisconsin, man. Come on. You're making from, us all look bad. And from like my side, if I wanted to convince you of my position, maybe bring you closer to where my position is, are you going to listen to me if I'm yelling at you? Probably yeah. not. You know, yeah. if I hold a sign in your face, I don't think Ben's going to probably <laughs> tune into what I'm saying. Uh, but yeah. everyone's got their own tactic. So. All right. We are going to put this up real quick. I know we have to go. But another mass shooting in Maine by a person with current history of mental illness. What will it take for you to support laws to get the hands out those with documented mental illness? Get well, the... I, I'm not aware of this. I've not heard of this shooting. But, of course, like anything. It happened last night. And there's other news this morning, but you know, you got up just in time for the show and you were in <laughs> yeah. Madison yesterday. I so I was up. Yeah. Early. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, like, like any situation, you have to wait till we know the facts of the case yeah. before pontificating to fit one narrative. Um, but yeah, we can, should definitely look at the facts of the case and figure out how we can do better. Awesome. And that's what I need to do. I need to go back and watch these shows and go, what could I have done better? 
<laughs> not, not <laughs> <perfect>. <laughs> no, whatever. <laughs> Special thank you to Wisconsin State Senator Romaine Quinn for taking the time to come on for the uh, uh, show today, our monthly show, which we do with the last Thursday of every month. I'll see you back here on Tuesday when Baron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald and I will be back for our weekly Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy show. So until then, for Dryden.com, I'm Ben Dryden saying thank you for watching, and as always, have a blessed day. <laughs>